Our scripture reading comes from the ending of the Gospel of Matthew. This takes place as one of the resurrection appearances. Um, As Matthew is telling us his story of Jesus' life, there are um, disciples who are not always perfect, who sometimes blatantly don't get it, but they're always there. And as the saying goes, sometimes most of life is just showing up. They're there as Jesus is um, ending his time on earth as the resurrected Christ. And this curious thing happens. Starting in verse 16 of chapter 28, we read, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now there are several curious things that we'll go over in this passage. But first, let us go again to God in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and thoughts of my mind and all of our witness to your faith after this go to the glory of your name, the peace of your world, and the salvation of your creation. Amen. So I mentioned before we are going over three questions, the first of which we answered last week, why do people need Jesus? Second, why do people need the church? And third, why oh, I'm losing my place here. Why do people need the church? And then, so today as we go over, why do people need the church? I'll leave you in suspense for the third one. As we look at why do people need the church, it's a question a lot of people ask. Um, Now, 50, 60 years ago, this was not a question anybody really asked a whole lot. Everyone knew that's just what you do if you're a good person. You just go to church. It's what everybody does, so that's what you should do. Now, however, as as faith and institutions have, have reduced a whole lot, we now do ask this question. And it's, I think, for a really good reason, because we always need to ask, why do people need the church in general? It helps us in our walk because we live life answering that question for ourselves and we can give that answer to others. We know in our hearts why people need the church. But we also have a better vision for what this is all supposed to mean. And people don't need the church so that we have something to do on Sundays. We don't need the church as an entertainment venue, but we need the church. People need the church so we can experience Jesus' love working in the world. And that goes twofold. There's a personal experience that you and I experience among this community of believers we have here at St. Paul's. We experience Jesus' love working in the world. But secondly... There are people outside these walls this morning who need to see and experience Jesus' love working too. And that only comes from church folks. Uh, Woody White, who is a a retired bishop and taught uh, United Methodist Church polity in uh, seminary, I took his class on polity and, and you may think polity, the institutional study of church laws and doctrine and processes and procedures, would be an insanely boring class. Um, but it wasn't. And, 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 you know, I don't remember everything about the uh, 2004 Book of Discipline that I learned in that class. But I do remember a quote that has just, it continues to stick with me. And it is, ain't no folks like church folks. You've probably heard me say this on occasion, haven't you? 
And you've heard me say it in both directions. There ain't no folk, ain't no folks like church folks. Ain't no folks like church folks. (laughs) Now, Bishop White uh, was one of the first African-American bishops elected to uh, the episcopacy in the new United Methodist Church after segregation ended. And um, his job as a member, as as the chair of the Committee on uh, Race Relations in the United Methodist Church, was to go, as as a black man, to go to um, churches and tell them about the new church structure that was going to happen. And um, now, some places received this wonderfully. Oh, great, there's been that, that black church down the street that we've just, we, we already do dinners with every year, and we always, you know, that's wonderful. Now they're part of the same, you know, we can do even more stuff close together. That's wonderful. Things aren't segregated anymore. Wonderful. And then there were other places where this African-American United Methodist who grew up in Harlem would go in and they would say, uh-uh. We are not going to be a part of the same system, and you're not going to tell us anything. Uh, He said he lost count of the number of times he was run out of towns and places, but he never was bitter about it. All he said was the quote he gave and passed on to our class, ain't no folks like church folks. Because sometimes, when he didn't expect it, God worked amazing miracles. Communities that were just ripped apart by racial strife and and, and, and anger and hatred. There was a church that he went to that would say, you know what, we have sinned in this. We need to make it better. Here's what we're going to do to reach out to our, our new official closer brothers who we're no longer segregated with. Because when church is working right... It is the answer to the world's problems. When it ceases to be an institution and it begins to be a movement with a point and a purpose, it's the answer to anything in the world. But, and then we say, ain't no folks like church folks. But when we get it wrong and we lose sight of the answer to this question, we often become the cause of a whole lot of terrible things. Religion at its best is the, wor- is the best thing in the world. Religion at its worst is often the worst thing in the world. Church at its best is the balm of Gilead that Deborah played for our prelude. It is the table of grace that we come to share and we come to experience. And that's why Jesus gives these last words to his disciples. He had told them already to go to this mountain in Galilee. Go there, I will meet you. And they get there. When they see him, they worshiped him. But some people doubted a little bit. Some people weren't quite ready to either let go of Jesus. We're not told what they doubted. Maybe they were trying to hold on to Jesus. Maybe they were not really sure about what all this meant. But Jesus tells his disciples that he has been granted all authority in heaven and on earth. He came near to them. He spoke to them those words. Now, he's received all power and all authority on earth. That's a pretty big deal. And then he tells his disciples, and we often just walk over this part of the passage without thinking about it. He tells his disciples... Not be afraid of me now. He tells his disciples, therefore, that means because he's received all authority and power in heaven and on earth, because of that, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Because of Jesus' power and authority, He tells them to go everywhere, to baptize people, teach them how to live like Jesus, teach them everything that they have been taught. And he's telling this even to the ones that doubt it. 
So for those of us who doubt sometimes, hey, that's all right. Jesus is still telling us, go, make disciples, baptize all nations, make disciples. Teach people the best that you can. How to love one another as I have loved you. How to do the things that I've commanded. Live the life that I've lived with you here on earth. Now, if the next sentence in this passage hadn't been written, this would seem a little dry, wouldn't it? Okay, I'm big and powerful, now go. Do what I tell you. But that's not what Jesus says. And so much of the Bible, you know, you look at how Jesus looks at power and authority and how revolutionary it is to many of the leaders we have Because of this, go and do this wonderful thing. Transform the world. Make disciples. Teach people to obey what I've commanded. And don't forget, I myself, that's an emphasis there, not I will be with you, but I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. That basically means forever. Until I come back to get you, I'll be with you. We're not meant to do this alone. Being a Christian is not a solitary activity. We're never meant to feel like we're doing our own faith alone. We're meant to be networked with others, to be intertwined with others, even those who might be doubting a little bit. But when we open ourselves up to that, when we live the gospel like that, We find we're doing this crazy thing called church. Keep in mind, Jesus could have, during his whole ministry, gone around and just said, heal, 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 and then done the thing he was supposed to do, but he didn't. He took a bunch of folks who were just like you and me, some wealthy, some poor, some educated, some non-educated, And he took them and said, I'm going to teach you what you need to know. You're not going to get it all at once, but I'm going to teach you about God's love and God's grace so that you'll be able to tell others about it. And I'm going to be with you. I'm still going to be here. This is not some sort of, I'm telling you what to do and then leaving. I'm still going to be with you always, every day. Until the end of the age. This is like that shepherd we read about last week. A shepherd is always a presence, right? Sheep have the shepherd around them. Jesus is just like that. Still just like that. Jesus gives his followers the same power that he has. When he says, I've been granted authority and I'll still be with you. Now go do these things. Jesus is telling them that he'll still be here. And people need the church, first of all, because the world needs the church. God's offer of salvation through Jesus is not about the building we're in today, as much as we may love it. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about trusting in his example, trusting in his love, and realizing when there are things that you don't get, You learn on those, you grow stronger in those, and you develop as a person and as a Christian. It's a relationship with Jesus that affects your relationship with others. And in a church, in a community, and I use the word church uh, the biblical way, ecclesia, the community of the called out ones. We have called out of the world into a relationship with Jesus. In a church community, we can practice how to love one another as Jesus would. We can teach other people and ourselves to obey what Jesus has commanded. We can support each other in the faith. We can lean on each other in times of struggle. We can band together to help other people see what Jesus' love looks like. We can join together to baptize new believers. We can band together to spread the faith to new places and new situations. So as Jesus is leaving his disciples... He's giving us our marching orders. 
He's telling us to get organized together. And he's telling us to tell others about his offer of salvation. And he's reminding us to love one another and the world around us. Church is simply that. The community of people who have been called out of the normal world into a world of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And who now are dedicated to making a difference in the world in Jesus' name. Whether that is one program or another, we'll go over that next week. As we ask the question, why does the world need our church? Because each church will do things uniquely. But basically, at its most essential elements, church is not about Sunday morning. Sunday morning is worship. Sunday morning is praise and thanksgiving, and it's wonderful. But that's nothing if it doesn't affect how we live the other six days of the week. Church should be a community that we can rest in, that we can recharge in, that we can learn in, that we can develop in, that we can learn how to trust Jesus more, that we can learn how to love people more deeply, the way that Jesus would, or we can learn to love the people in our church more deeply, just as Jesus would. Because as Bishop White said, there ain't no folks like church folks. So, coming to the table of Holy Communion, it's a time when we do remember that that we are all united by that one thing. That is not what the world would tell us we may be united by. We come to the table not as people of a different region of the country, not as Democrats or Republicans or Independents. We come to the table as Christians. Jesus asked his followers at that table that day to just remember his sacrifice for them, to remember the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and to just come and share in the gifts that God has provided. We also come to the table as a family with all of our struggles and imperfect relationships to eat and drink from the abundant grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no entrance exam. There's simply grace.